Yeah, so welcome everyone to our discussion on education. I love that this is happening in a lecture theatre. I think this just feels right, don't you? Um, so we're on a little bit of a time limit, so I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, we have a couple of uh, serial entrepreneurs um, and an AI robotics expert, so it should be quite interesting discussion. Um, I'm going to start with you, Audrey, because I believe you started your... Um, ed tech company, Ostaz, in 2017. Yes. Um, I mean, that's before any of us knew what COVID was. <laughs> Remember those days? Um, before the pandemic just changed everything for education. So, I mean, the last couple of years must just have changed things completely for you. So what has your experience been like? How, is, how has business evolved since then? I feel bad to say it, but uh, in reality, COVID served us well. I mean, in the education sector. So basically, just our story, as you mentioned, we were completely, so Ostaz is a booking platform for online tutoring. And when we sold online tutoring to schools and universities, uh, we, we, we work a lot with uh, Dubai as well, American Academy. They thought we were crazy. And so the schools such, shut us down. And as soon as the pandemic hit, we actually had immediately access to the online learning. And some small stats, we went from 100% offline one-to-one -one sessions during the pandemic overnight, 100% online. And I can tell you, a lot of people said, okay, after the pandemic is done, Thing, things will go back to normal. What we've noticed is that 80% of our sessions are still online. And why? Because we noticed that most parents and learners enjoy the online experience and we prove to them that it's as efficient and as good and result-driven as in-person sessions. And it unlocks a lot of things such as cross-border learning, how powerful it would be if now you're sitting, you want to learn Spanish in Alguna, you're immediately connected in a tap of a button with a Spanish teacher in Spain. This was not possible previously. Second, Let's talk about Cairo. Our teachers were stuck in traffic for hours. And just to give a one hour online session, it doesn't make sense. Now they do it from the comfort of their home. Another trend, interesting trend that we saw is the immersive uh, online learning that makes your experience super fun with VR and AR. Let me give you an example. We've done a pilot project. If I want to teach you the history of Egypt and walk you through the pyramids, for example. Before, back then, it was all in a textbook. Now I tell you, put your binoculars on and let's go and discover Egypt together. I can tell you, this is such a memorable experience that you won't forget it. And a last trend, and then you'll talk, gentlemen. <laughs> It's about self-learning, and we notice that a lot of learners love and enjoy learning alone through interactive videos, and it's proven to be super effective. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, it's quite interesting you say that people have really loved the online learning experience. I have some friends that are teachers, and they, they, it took them a while <laughs> to learn to love it. I have to say they found it very stressful. Uh, but I think it's just it's never going to, uh, you know, it, it, things have changed for good. Exactly. You know, um, you, you mentioned how it's become so much easier for cross-border learning, and I think that ties very, very nicely. Well An done. awesome segue. <laughs> Excellent segue. Um, so, um, Abdel Rahman, sorry. <laughs> so, Educately. You got it right. I did pronounce that right. Very proud. Thank you. So, um, Educately connects students with international universities. Um, you and, and your uh, alumni of the World Youth Forum, so congratulations. Um, you set yourself up in 20, well, you're a serial entrepreneur, but you set Educately up in 2020, is that correct? Yeah, we set yeah. up in 2020, but actually, sitting right there in the audience is the, the true mastermind behind the, behind the idea who started doing that manually back in 2016. First Egyptian went to study in Italy, uh, Mo, and then from that point forth, he helped more than 50 students to go study in Italy. And that was the actual nucleus and the seed behind the idea itself. That's incredible. And so 2020 came, everything went online. It was an opportunity. You grabbed it. Um, obviously, though, you weren't the only one. There's uh, so many more players now in the market. What are your thoughts on whether or not, I mean, are there too many players? Is the market saturated? Or do you think there's still room for, for new startups to solve some problems? Um, 
when people think ed tech, most of the time they think, yeah, there's a lot of players. There's a lot of players providing different experiences, be it in tutoring, be it in online learning, being it connecting young people to opportunities. Um, but when you come to look at it, this is a multi-trillion dollar industry. People would usually view healthcare or view other industries to be more, let's say, sexy or more appealing. So it, if another Amazon comes up in e-commerce or there are 50 players, no one's going to say anything because people are going to keep shopping. Um, or if another 500 hospitals come up, no one's going to say anything because people need to always get healthcare. At the fundament, education is the same. And as a sphere, it is with unlimited opportunities. Um, we get asked a lot that question about like saturation, investor appetite, is there, is there an opportunity there? But when we come to look at it, the educational experience or the journey of a young person, um, and here I'm not saying a student because education is the right of every young person, every person in the world, it's a human right, basic, um, is a very long journey, starting all the way from K to 12, then going through your higher education experience, then going later on into post-grad, and that's a very, very long journey. Different players have a lot of opportunity to come in and disrupt different parts of that value chain. So when we came to go to market, our thought was, okay, out there you see, in social networking, you see Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, blah, blah, blah. everyone's socially networking with each other. That's happening. When people are looking for jobs, they'd go to LinkedIn. But when people are looking for education, where do they go? Where do you go to look for education opportunities? School, Coursera. Still not a lot of names, right? Yeah. <laughs> but we thought, why does it not exist a social network out there that gives young people the opportunity at a click of a button, build one profile, be able to apply to a university in China, a university in the UK, and a university in the US with minimal edits to your profile and being able to cater to that need. Where and what to study, at simple. And in the same time, before even making that decision, be able to chat with someone, just have a conversation. If you wanna go study in the UK, talk to someone that went and studied in the UK. Understand what was their experience like, what did they gain out of it, how was their career path afterwards, et cetera, et cetera, and try to build a community around it. Not just centered around the idea of building another listing platform where you go and it's just full of like, this university, that's the ranking, apply here. This is the university, that's the ranking, get a consultation. We wanna take it beyond that. We wanna take it deeper into the experience economy itself which disrupted things like mobility, disrupted things like tourism, is disrupting things like education and learning and tutoring. Why is it not disrupting the full spectrum of my experience of making that decision? And that's basically what we want to do. So we see an opportunity for that. Excellent. It's interesting you said, because you're also an angel investor yourself, right? Okay, so you're, you're well versed in seeing where there are opportunities. Um, I, ho I hope so. Shriz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shrijit. That's right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're not a serial entrepreneur, from what I understand. Not yet. <laughs> not yet. That's the attitude. Um, but you, you are a long-standing expert in AI, robotics, STEM education, and you're currently in K-12. So, I mean, another really interesting perspective. Um, so, I mean, that's a segment that was, I mean, completely disrupted over the last couple of years. So, how have things evolved um, for you? Um, how, how are things continuing to evolve? What's your new normal feel like? And how do you see this kind of evolution future-proofing for the future? Um, future-proofing for the future, obviously. <laughs> but for countries, businesses, um, society, etc. Yeah, so... Uh, from a K-12 perspective, I think we were like forced to, uh, with COVID to uh, abandon our fear of shift and basically it gave us a freedom of uh, knowing and delving into the unknown. Uh, convincing teachers to move to the online learning platforms, uh, convincing students to uh, learn from home, all, all of these were kind of uh, not planned for, right? So. But we saw a distinction in, in number of our schools because we own a lot of different schools and a lot of different uh, market segments uh, that the adoption of this was uh, not very homogeneous, right? So uh, some schools made it a success, some schools struggled, and uh, it was kind of being re reflective of what the industry was in general. Um, so I think this was a good outcome of COVID that it uh, opened our eyes into uh, the 
open to adopting change and be open to uh, integration of technology in our processes. Um, so what we try to do at GEMS as well is uh, pass on this kind of learning that we as, as a company get to our students as well, because they're going to be the future, they're going to be the citizens of the future. So uh, we have to make them ready and at least make them aware of what are all the technologies, what are all the uh, skill sets that are required by, uh, by the workforce. Um, so some of the strategies that we have developed, uh, we were on the brink of developing them pre-COVID, but COVID really accelerated it. And uh, we are seeing the results of those things at the moment, and uh, we are only propelling towards uh, bigger things, especially in creating partnerships with uh, higher education and the workforce and the community, uh, rather than just keeping it in a K-12 silo and, and thinking just about uh, producing students for universities, but also producing students for producing citizens, rather uh, successful citizens who have an open mind. Uh, and and uh, I'm sure the experience that they've gone through uh, for COVID, uh, some of them definitely would have some uh, um, good takeaways from it, uh, learn a lot of life lessons. That's a really interesting point because, the, yeah, yeah the, the needs of the market have changed drastically. It's not just schools, it's, it's the workplace. It's, it's just not the same. It's just not the same at all. So coming back to you, Audrey, um, because you're dealing kind of directly with students and linking them up with teachers, how are you finding that the needs and demands of those students have changed? And how are you finding that new development in technology is kind of helping you achieve Honestly, it changed a lot, and I'm happy that we work as a startup in a very agile work environment. So we're very close to our consumers and learners, and we always hear their feedback. And thanks to them, we think outside of the box, otherwise we go obsolete. So interesting needs from the student, they want to learn in a new way, in a fun way, in a gamified way. And today we always keep on looking for new technologies or working with third parties that allow us to offer this engaging learning opportunity, such as, for instance, during the pandemic, we were working with some tools like Kahoot for math. We added some avatars to make it a sort of a bit gamified. And a third point that's quite interesting, our learners of today Day, they want everything in one app. They want to find a teacher in one app, find their content, assessment, learning progress, all in one app. And the most interesting part, and I was actually surprised, we launched a new feature as a pilot project to test it, where we said, you know what, as top students, you're going to compete against your peers. Uh, for example, let's talk about English. And what we notice is that when someone, for instance, like Luz, they try again and they keep on trying because what they want to see is their name on the leaderboard. And it's crazy, but as human beings, we're super competitive competitive. And it's insane how this gamified, competitive way allowed us to actually push learners to be hooked to our platform and keep on trying. So the future of learning is to learn in a new and fun way. This is what we notice. Excellent. So then moving on from that back to kind of market demands, um, how, Abdul Rahman, how are you seeing, because you, you, you deal with international universities as well, so how are you seeing um, global trends kind of move in line with regional ones and how do you think that they're lining up with the needs in the labor force? I think uh, Audrey also said something that's really cool, which is the idea that like Today's generation wants everything in the same place, or that idea of super apps that are capable of catering for your experience, or different parts of it. Um, and I think in, when it comes to trends in education itself, we're seeing a little bit of the opposite of that. So we build a super app where a student can basically search for universities, compare masters, bachelors, PhDs anywhere in the world, be able to apply, then be able to get financing, have all of that in the same app, that's fine. But when it comes to the type of program they'd be looking for, the trend is actually moving towards hyper-specialization. Because the labor market is demanding hyper-specialization. Um, so if you think like, like us, like, like startups, not you yet, you, you're gonna- Not yet, right? not yet. He, he's, gonna, he's gonna get there. The, the bug is crazy. Yeah. Um, when, when we're hiring, you would, you, you're looking for the type of profiles that, for example, in, in the data sphere, you'd hire a data scientist, a data analyst, and a business intelligence specialist. These are three different jobs. 
with three different job functions that are might all fall under the idea of like data management but that's not necessarily how it is so universities that are starting to realize that and education institutions that are starting to realize that and offer young people the opportunity to start maybe start general and then go deeper get hyper specialized across your journey on shorter courses so you don't need to study anymore for four years. You don't need to study anymore for five years. You can get, get your degree done and dusted in two and a half, three years because you're specialized. Mm -hmm. Use the first six months, use your first semester to explore, try to understand. Invest more in exploring your passion. Get a diverse set of opportunities and then dive deeper. And because that's a deep dive, it doesn't need to take you five years to be able to build that specialization. Pursue that even further later in your postgrad if you want to continue your studies. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of that in that adoption. Uh, of course, we're seeing a lot of new trends when it comes to the type of majors and programs even that are there. So we're seeing majors and programs that are related to sustainability. That was never a conversation when I was back in school. Uh, when I was going back to school, um, maybe people are from my generation would, would relate to that, especially Egyptians. You're either going to become an engineer yeah. or a pharmacist <laughs> or a doctor and that, or a physician. Yeah. And that's basically the name of the game. And that's what everyone's aspiring to do. Even that type of mentality, I think on a parent side is changing. Like when our generation is looking at raising kids and, and, and what are we aspiring to see them become, it's becoming more trendy. You're seeing people taking masters in sports management. You're seeing people taking masters in um, data factoring. I didn't even know what that means. <laughs> uh, what does that mean? The other day, Mo was just releasing a job opportunity in blockchain development. I'm like, Okay, well, what is that person going to do exactly? Mm. Like a cryptography, and they're going to do something. I'm like, okay, that looks cool. Yeah. Kid has a black screen in front of them all the time. I don't even know what it means. <laughs> like, looks like he's doing a good job. Fantastic. Leaves at seven. Yeah, okay. You need a little bit of balance in your life. Mm -hmm. But I think things are moving towards that realm where the, the labor market is having bigger impact on the type of curriculums and programs that are being developed, and we're seeing the, those trends starting all the way maybe even from high schools in terms of how students are being counseled. Yeah, excellent segue. I could just leave this to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Turning to the, the K-12 market, I mean, looking, um, hearing from Audrey about how, how, how students really want to learn in completely different ways and talking about you know, the different needs of the workforce. What are your thoughts on how we can introduce di digital literacy more into a school curriculum that enables students to be more prepared for their future? Right. Uh so I completely agree with uh, what the other panelists are saying is uh, it's all about realization first and then adoption. Uh, K-12 education in general, we're kind of, or we were kind of a bit stuck with the archaic ways of imparting education, but not anymore, thankfully. Uh, and all this is thanks to the industrial revolution that's happening. So we're just uh, kind of not there yet, but at least trying to be there yet. Um, and that goes to say with uh, K-12, even not, not just high school, but even middle school and elementary school students learning topics like blockchain, AI, robotics. Um, we have been adopting um, the latest technologies and just not imparting the education, but teaching those technologies as part of the curriculum in, in the schools as well. Uh, one of our strategies is our metaverse strategy, wherein uh, we are trying to create a digital twins of our labs and our schools. And uh, students not only view content in virtual reality, but they're also creating the content. So they're consumers and creators at the same time. Uh, we have partnered with uh, uh, Unity and Unreal Engine companies that are doing partnerships traditionally with higher education, but now we are also bringing them to K-12. We got our teachers certified to create content. Um, so and so forth. So, and the same thing is going on with blockchain. Uh, we are working on our blockchain strategy wherein uh, all our students, right from kindergarten to grade 12, uh, all the accomplishments that they'll garner throughout the journey of their school life will be based on their blockchain wallet. Uh, they're creating artwork in wow. the form of NFTs. These kids understand this stuff better than I do. <laughs> Because uh, we have to think kind of, uh, especially for us, 
from K-12, we have to think 15, 20 years in the future because when a student comes into our system, they will graduate and enter the workforce after 15 years. So we kind of have to work backwards and see what will be the skill sets, what will be the technology, what will be the world that they will be living in and try to give them a hint of what they are about to expect. That's incredible. <laughs> Genuinely, I'm gonna. I, I, I have a 13 year old nephew, and I have to ask him questions quite a lot about you know the things that he's working on and terminology I don't understand. It's it's just amazing. Um, so coming back to you, Audrey, um, what does the? I mean, we're, we're talking a lot about the future of education. What what does the future look like for you and for your platform specifically? Um, and what do you actually think is going to be the next disruptor? We're all different, right? Every single person is different. We're complex. We have different passions, uh, different career aspirations. Uh, we're so different. And unfortunately, when you look at the education system, it's still very standardized. And the future of education, I see it in adaptive learning. It's not another fancy word like the metaverse or blockchain. It's really where we see the future. Uh, like, this is where we're going to be in a couple of years. Why? I'll explain how I see it. And I want to walk you through this journey. And I remember back in the days, if you're not a good mathematician or you're not a good scientist, you're a failure. You cannot be in arts. You're not allowed to be in arts, at least in my school. And as you mentioned, you, you have to be either a lawyer or an engineer, and that's it. It stops there, or a doctor. And unfortunately, we're not empowering the kids of tomorrow to explore themselves and to explore their talent. How I see it happening is we want to build, and that's the future of Ostaz, a school for every single learner. We are allowed to have our own curriculum, right? I want to design it like I want. I want this technology and this AI to understand me and to push courses and content based on my career aspiration, based on what I like, not what someone else like. And this is really powerful, and that's the future of education. I want to add one more thing that's quite interesting. If, for example, I go on this platform, uh, and also you push courses that are today hype, kind of, and super in demand, I don't want to graduate and I'm already outdated. I'm fed up of this, right? We all paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, especially those that go to the US, to Harvard, Stanford. They graduate, we employ them, they're obsolete. It doesn't make sense. I don't want to wait one full year to learn what is blockchain. I don't want to wait one full year to learn about the metaverse. I want this platform or this institution or this academy to teach me blockchain and to teach me the skills of tomorrow today. Otherwise, I'll become obsolete. For those of you who were yesterday, we had three top CEOs from Egypt who mentioned we as CEOs should contribute to the curriculum because as employers, we really need to make sure that the talent of tomorrow knows what to expect. And this is quite important. Does, does this involve a bit of a crystal ball, though, to see what's coming up in the future? Does this, does this, sorry, it's a question I haven't prepared you for, sorry. No, no, it's because you're saying how like you need to be preparing um, the, the kids of K-12 for, for jobs that are coming, you know, five, ten years in their future. I mean, how do you keep up with that? It's an interesting one. That's why we should actually uh, hold, uh, work hand in hand with user, we call it user generated content. We have brilliant minds. Why to wait for an academy or a school? Uh, we have the experts of tomorrow that are here today that spoke about the metaverse. Why not allow them to generate content on our platform so that everyone is uh, uh, up to date? To be honest, you speak about the metaverse and I heard about it. I still don't understand it. I I wish there is an expert in this domain that could just upload content on our platform to teach us. And I think this is only possible by joining forces, not only with institutions, but also with experts that are living it. And you know who are the experts today? The Gen Z and the young generation. Because they understand it. It's just so intuitive for them. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I don't know. I think Shirley is also an expert. <laughs> no, our kids are. Uh, we have students in, in K-12 who are CEOs of their own companies. So that really... Are you kidding? Yeah, it amazes us. And that actually propelled us to actually force us to have conversations with the government to, to support these initiatives, uh, even to lower the age of company formation from 18 to 16, so they have their company registered. We also have plans for our students from our entrepreneurship uh, centers uh, that once they complete their K-12, they not only graduate with their certificates of academic, but also a trade license. Every student has a business while they graduate. So those are the conversations we're having right now because that's where the industry is. Entrepreneurship is the key. And uh, for us, we would really like uh, most of them to be part of the 30 and the 30 in the very future. <laughs> Oh, well, I'm sure they will be. <laughs> They're way ahead of me at 16, my goodness. Um, Abdul Rahman, what are your thoughts on how technology, on, the, on the, all this technology entering the, uh, the education system? Yeah, okay, so let's, uh, let's play a game. I think you're getting a bit sleepy and we've been talking for a lot. Okay, who here has a phone, a mobile phone? Can you hold your phone up? Okay, we're going to do something very interesting. Can you unlock your phone? Unlocked, all good? I want you to go to your favorite messaging app. You make your pick. Instagram, uh, DMs, whatever, WhatsApp, iMessage. You're there? You're there? You're good? And now I want you to pick a conversation you really like. It can be an intimate conversation, your favorite conversation with your favorite person, best friend, significant other. Just make your pick. Good? If it's your favorite person, they should be in your top three, kind of. So if you're really looking, maybe they're not that much of your favorite person. That's a takeaway beyond the session. Um, are you ready? I want you to pass the phone to the person beside you. You're all very compliant, I have to say. <laughs> and then text me your pin number. No, it's not happening? Okay, I'm joking. Thank you, you don't need, you don't, yeah, you don't need to do that. I was joking. So here's the thing. You can lock your phones. Again, you're not going to pass it. It's fine. It's just a social experiment for the mind. When we look at the future of the platform or the future of any platform, most of those apps that you would have opened already did this exact same handshake exercise with you. When you trusted them to download them, give them your user data, and give them your user data every single day intuitively without even thinking about it. You do that exact same handshake. That messaging app that you're using host some of your most intimate conversations to a crazy extent and you trust them so what would it take when we think what would it take for us to be able to cater or deliver to young people all around the world that exact same kind of trust when they think about their next step what is more intimate to a person in terms of a decision than the decision of their future where to go what to do what to become, their aspirations, their dreams. It takes a lot of trust and confidence for them to decide to choose educately, give us your data, and we're going to take care of that. We're going to tra try to take that dream, we're going to host it, we're going to hold it responsibly, and we're going to try to fulfill it. Be it by referring you to Ustez to get customized learning, or be it by referring you to whatever one of the platforms that both of you are mentioning to get a short degree, or be it that if you don't even want to pursue a degree, let's connect you to a place that can necessarily help you cater for that. But that degree of trust that you just showcased is what would we aspire one day to be able to deliver to our young people. That's the power of technology, right? Incredible. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Well, how are we doing for time? Um, can, I, can I ask one more question and then we'll go to the audience? <laughs> You're okay. Sorry, I just had one more question left for Shrijit. Um, because, I mean, your K-12 education, um, do you foresee a time when the online learning model fully comes back again? Do uh, personally, I think it's, it's still there. It's not disappeared. It's just that students are there in the classroom right now, but there's still a lot of education that happens online, even if they're not distant, right? And I feel uh, the traditional brick and mortar school is not going to disappear, but the online education model is going to heavily supplement uh, the, the teaching and learning that happens in the classroom. Uh, 
by connecting them to other campuses, by connecting K-12 schools to higher education, students uh, accessing a professor's lecture from the university in a fifth grade classroom, uh, students uh, seeing how a Tesla car is being assembled uh, from engineers in Tesla office. So these are the kind of learning that's going to be, uh, that's con that we're going to experience in the future. And I think online learning is going to be that shape. So a uh, hybrid kind of hybrid, for yeah. the future. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, guys. Have we got time for some questions? Uh, yeah. um, no, but does anyone in the audience have any questions for our panelists? Sorry, if you can give us your name, please. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Mariam, and I'm an, an expert in education. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for Educately. Good job, guys. And I have a question for um, Audrey, please. Um, two questions, very quick. One is, uh, where do you find your teachers? So what kind of networks do you go for? And the second question is, what do you do with copyright of the material that you put? So f for the first question, uh, we have in our region, and I'm proud to say, especially in Egypt, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, brilliant talent. We have two types of teachers. We have brilliant university students, some of you are here, and we have also teachers from schools. And definitely it's important to make sure that we deliver quality education, so we have a very th thorough pre-screening process. So we have an interview, a test, and then a training by the British Council on the teaching methodology, especially with the online learning, because you have another method of delivering the content. Uh, for the second question, we don't really deal with copyright because what we offer is school subjects, languages, so we follow the curriculum. Uh, and we don't deliver content, we, t we take actually the curriculum of the school. Now something that we're working on, we just signed a big deal with Aldar Education, which is a group of schools in Abu Dhabi and the whole UAE. We're gonna work hand in hand with them to develop our own IP and our own content to make it more engaging. And this is how we deal with the copyright. Any other questions? No questions, it's education. <laughs> okay, I guess we can move on to the next panel. <laughs>